When we think about the colors of Dune, we think about this. But there is also this. My grandmother used to say that every house is a world, and this phrase is literal in Dune. But more importantly, in this film, every world is a color, or in some cases, the absence of colors. The planet of the Arkham and to have the same approach as Frank Herbert did with Arrakis for the Fremen. Gilly Prime is a plastic world, an artificial world cut from nature, a totalitarian environment where the rulers are, are fascist. And, and, and I thought that this idea to subtract color from their world will say something about their way of thinking. There's no doubt that great films are those that establish a color code, but the best ones are those that establish it only to break it later. And that's precisely what Dune does. Since that night, my father has not been the same. The main colors of the Emperor's House Carino are grays and golds, and those are the ones we always see whenever they are on screen. That's all you know. But in its introduction, why does the movie decide to portray him surrounded by green? For I know he loved you, blood of trees like a son. Well, it turns out that at this moment, the daughter speaks of how her father is saddened by the death of Leto. And do you know what is the characteristic color of the Atreides? Exactly, green. So this is how I will survive. Something akin happens when Paul suggests that the pathway to survival is... By being Arcanans. Immediately afterward, we cut to scenes where Arrakis appears as a completely new place, where the characteristic sepia colors are replaced by monochromatic palettes, rendering the place unrecognizable even by its shapes, much sharper. Plus, the sound design is quite reminiscent of the Harkonnen soundtrack. But the most important scene is when Paul walks towards the Freeman. Here, the contrast of black against the white sky makes him resemble a Harkonnen lost in the desert. Even his handling of the Freeman strongly resembles how the Harkonnens prepare their armies before a fight. The Harkonnens are associated with darkness, with a lack of color, and that's no mystery. That's why at the beginning of the scene where Paul talks with his mother about his blood, the light literally goes out. What's interesting is that if you read the book, the pennants of House Harkonnen are described as orange, but the movie never emphasizes that. You might imagine that if the black and white scenes were in color, the presence of orange would be imposing, but that would break the internal code. The idea is to contrast these cultures in the best possible way, so that the Harkonnens on Arrakis truly seem like an external presence invading the space, which would be impossible if they had orange colors. And this is a very clever way to play with color, because it's one of the fundamental elements of cinematic language. But how do you play with color when your main setting is an endless desert with the color of sand in every direction you look? Our, our artist alone at the beginning, where it was about to define the um, main visual language of the movie about vehicles and architecture, but also more importantly, the light. What the light on Arrakis would, will look like. What, what would be the emotions coming out of this light, the qualities, the contrast. This is something you can see in how Arrakis shifts its tones to mirror the emotional tone of each scene. If the normal temperature is neutral, almost cold, when Paul is about to manipulate the Freeman, we almost switch to monochrome, and during the war or conflicts, such as at the beginning of the movie, the temperature is so warm that the heat of the image seeps through the screen. And that's because warm tones are associated with war in this film. That's why when Jessica announces it by saying this, the holy war begins. She is dressed in an almost red outfit, different from the ones we saw her wearing before, which is not a minor detail, because historically red is the color of holy war. There's a discernible pattern where colors grow colder as we are closer to Paul's past while they warm up as we approach the future. Take, for instance, those future visions featuring the purest red we see in both movies, a symbolic harbinger of the impending warfare and bloodshed. And I particularly cite the example of when Paul discovers he is of Harkonnen blood because what I find most interesting about Dune is how throughout its two films, its protagonist undergoes a series of metamorphoses related to his identity, and more than once, these are reflected through color schemes. A prime illustration of this occurs following the ambush on the Atreides, marking what I consider to be his initial significant transformation, depicted across a series of three scenes. The first one is when Jessica and Paul are kidnapped on a ship and must escape, Remove her gag. where the predominant color is green. The second is a parallel montage between Leto being executed and Jessica and Paul finding the ring in Dr. Yue's letter. This is Dr. Yue's handwriting. And the third is the turning point in Paul's transformation, where the light is red. As you can see, the first and last are with opposing colors on the color wheel, and this makes sense. But to understand the brilliance behind it, let's go step by step. Paul, oh, wake up. What's wrong? Get dressed and come with me. Throughout the movie, we witness a distant relationship between Paul and Jessica, with her constantly issuing orders, making demands, and even endangering his life. Poison needle, instant death. 
She's always the one who controls the situation and that's because what we perceive as a breakfast between mother and son is actually a training session between master and apprentice. If you want it, make me give it to you. Use the voice. Mom, I just woke up. That's why their first interaction in the movie revolves around her insisting that he ask for water using the power of his voice. Give me the water. There is a constantly dominant stance of hers towards him, even at breakfast. Almost. Shut up. Take note of Jessica's demeanor towards Paul, even in a life and death situation. This scene on the ship is the last one we see where this dynamic of mother-son prevails so prominently, where she tells him what to do, or instructs him, and even when he has just saved her life, she continues to reproach him and demand more and more. Your pitch was too forced. Then, we move to a scene where the characters descend from the ship and discover the Atreides' house completely destroyed. It's there that they must face the desert, quite literally, and turn their backs on their old life. But there's something still holding them there, and that's what we cut to in the next shot. Lido. That's how we move on to the second scene of this triad, where a very particular parallel montage takes place. The color is characteristic of Arrakis, but the tone is so similar that they seem to be in the same place, which makes sense because they are discovering his death as it's happening. And it's not until Leto breathes his last that Paul fully discovers the ring. This is not a minor detail because in its introductory scene, we have a shot of Paul walking, followed by a shot of a hand on Leto's father's grave, which at first we might believe belongs to Paul, but later we discover it is Leto's. From the first interaction, they are related through montage as father and son by their hands, and they also do so in the last. Returning to this sequence of scenes, it's after Paul has a vision of the future that we move on to the third scene. My father's dead. In this scene, Paul begins his transformation because Leto's death marks a turning point, and Paul accepts his position as Duke of House Atreides by putting on the ring. From the scene onwards, the dynamic changes. Unlike the constant in the movie, Paul starts taking the initiative, while Jessica takes on a more passive role, which is why it's so important to mirror it to this other scene. You need to drink. It's recycled water from the tank. The bond is reset starting in the same way, with water. This resource that was once mundane is now sacred, rooted in sweat and tears. From this reset of the bond, it's Paul who leads everything, marking the beginning of his evolution. Let's get out of here. Now, he's the one constantly giving orders and directions, and his mother follows him. i breathe through this. Are you good? Yeah. We'll cross after dark. We can't walk like regular humans. If we do, we're dead. Okay, follow me. Do the same moves. Which is even visually reflected with Paul always ahead or above. But why does Villeneuve choose green for the last scene of Paul's previous life with his mother, and red for the beginning of the new one? Well, as I mentioned, green is the emblem of House Atreides, and it brings us back to Paul's past because it's not only present in his family emblem, but also in all the fauna of his planet. This color is linked to his life before that travel to Arrakis that would change everything, while red is linked to Paul's future. That's why the purest red in the movie is seen in Paul's warm visions of the future, representing the bloodshed and warfare that loom on the horizon. It's no coincidence that when Paul finishes his transformation, a steady warmth permeates the cinematography, comparable to that of the visions in the first movie, where the only thing that stands out is Chani's blue armband. Its justification seems to be that the women of the Fremen wear a blue scarf when they are paired, but I would like to go beyond that. Blue is a color that is absent throughout the entire movie. The only places it appears besides Chani's kerchief are in the water of life and in the eyes of the Fremen. And the use of color in Dune is not mathematical. But if the blue of these three elements has anything to do with each other, it's that they all relate to desire and particularly hope. That's not hope! Okay, what I mean is that the Fremen, as a people, embody a sense of anticipation and hopefulness, a quality that Frank Herbert skillfully captures through characters whose perspectives are literally shaped by expectation. It's not for nothing that they are called the eyes of Abad, with Abad being a word whose meaning is servant. They are the eyes of servants awaiting the arrival of a savior. Just as Jessica and Paul anticipate the water of life as the solution to their problems, or as Charney hopes Paul won't let her down, a hope that ultimately proves futile. That's why her ending is her alone. Lost in an infinite desert, with no colors left in her life, other than the dry sand. I just started this channel this month, so if you made it this far, it would be a great help if you subscribed or told me what else you'd like me to talk about. Thanks for watching.